You know, when I was growing up, it's probably about eight years old, and at the time, we were living in Silver Spring. Yeah. Yes. Common misconception about me in D.C. A lot of people think I'm from the hood. That's not true. But I never bothered to correct anybody <laughs> because I wanted the streets to embrace me. As a matter of fact, I, I kept it up as a ruse. Like sometimes I'll hang out with rappers like Nas and them, and these motherfuckers will start talking about the projects. Yo, it was wild in the PJs, yo. And I'll be like, word, nigga, word. But I don't know. I have no idea. My parents did just well enough so that I could grow up poor around white people. And to be honest, when Nas and them talk about the projects, nigga, I used to get jealous. Because it, it sounded fun. Everybody in the projects was poor. And that's fair. But if you were poor in Silver Spring, nigga, it felt like it was only happening to you. I know the pain of that first sleepover at a white friend's house. <laughs> And you come back home on Sunday and just look at your parents like, y'all need to step your game up. <laughs> Everything in Timmy's house works. <laughs> Remember the first time you saw that? In a cold winter, and you'd be at a white friend's house and see the motherfuckers in their living room without their coats on? Timmy was one of my first white friends, like, in my life, man. He's a good dude, too. He moved to Silver Spring from Utah, of all places. I guess his family was affiliated with that Mormon church they got down there. And me and him used to hang out. And one day I was at his house. We were just hanging out. And, and Timmy says, Dave, why don't you stay for dinner tonight? I said, oh, man, I'd love to, but I can't. If I'm not home before dark, my mother will kill me. That was a lie. <laughs> My mother had several jobs. I hadn't seen her in like three or four days. <laughs> At that point in my life, it was my experience that white dinner wasn't delicious. <laughs> I'd rather go home and fry some bologna or some shit like that. But then old Timmy threw me a curveball I wasn't expecting. He said, oh, it's too bad you can't stay, Dave, because um, mom uh, made stovetop stuffing. I said, what the fuck, stovetop? Well, hold on, nigga, let me make some phone calls real quick. I had seen that commercial so many times, I had dreamt of getting my hands on some of that stovetop stuffing. And finally, I met a motherfucker that actually had a box of stovetop in the house. I couldn't miss this opportunity, so I pretended to call my mother. And then I came back and I said, Timmy, Timmy, you're not going to believe this great news. Mom said I can stay. And he said, fantastic. He said, why don't you come with me and we'll help set the table and then we can say the blessing. I had no interest in setting this motherfucker's table or saying these crazy ass Mormon prayers. I just wanted that goddamn stuffing. <laughs> my hands first. My plan was simple. Wash my hands slowly, and by the time I'm done, the table will be set, the blessing will be said, and all that there will be left to do is eat. <laughs> Went to the bathroom. I washed my hands very slowly. I must have been in there for about 10 minutes. <laughs> and suddenly, one of his mothers came to the door. She was like, hi, David, right? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, Timmy tells me that you're planning on staying for dinner. I said, I hope that's not a problem, ma'am. She says, no, it's no problem. In fact, we'd love to have you. It's just that we weren't expecting company. And I'm afraid there's not enough stovetop stuffing <laughs> for everybody. 
So I kicked her in the pussy. <laughs> Bam! Ladies and gentlemen, I told you I'm dope, nigga. I told you what I was gonna say, and you still didn't see it coming. And that's why I make the big bucks. Oh, my God. But there's a more important reason that I would stop doing comedy right now. And this reason is the real reason that's been percolating, and, and it really is the crowd, not you. I'm talking about the crowd on the big stage. It's too hard to entertain a country whose ears are so brittle. Motherfuckers are so sensitive, the whole country has turned into bitch-ass niggas. Everything you say upsets somebody. You know, I can remember when it all started. It was when I was doing Chappelle's show. When I was doing Chappelle's show, I used to do the show, and then on the weekends, I'd do, like, concerts and shit like that. So I'm doing a concert, and there was a couple in the front row, beautiful couple. The wife, wife was obviously Asian. You could see it in her face. The husband, this motherfucker was mysterious, to say the least. <laughs> Couldn't quite pinpoint where he was from. Caramel-colored fella, very nice hair, but he could have been from anywhere, Bangladesh, Mexico. I can't guess with a nigga like this. <laughs> All I knew for sure about this guy is that his wife was a bitch. <laughs> I could see that in her face, too. No, he was laughing and having a good time, and she was scowling at me at a goddamn comedy show. I couldn't figure it out. And then I realized at some point that she was pregnant, and I was smoking on stage. I said, oh, my God, that's probably why she's mad. So I started to put my cigarette out, but then she hit me with one of them fake non-smoker calls. <coughs> so I just kept smoking. I thought to myself, bitch, that babe will be fine. Relax. And I tried to break the tension. I just asked her. I, that's all I said. I go, hey, wh where are you guys from anyway? And I could tell that she was on to me. She goes, very condescendingly, she says, I'm from California. <laughs> if you're asking my ethnicity, I am Chinese. He was like, I'm Mexican, bro. <laughs> I said, well, I'm sorry if I offended you by asking, but you're a very beautiful couple. And miss, there's no question that you're going to give birth to the hardest working baby this world has ever seen. <laughs> That's not a bad joke. She got very upset. She got up to leave immediately, but she didn't just leave. She had to take one last dig at me on the way out. I will never buy one of your fucking DVDs again, Dave Chappelle. I said, ma'am, with all due respect, Chinese people don't buy DVDs. <laughs> and the crowd went crazy. We were all laughing, having a good time. I didn't even think anything of it. And then just three days later, this lady sends a fucking letter to my promoter telling him not to book me for shows anymore because I was, quote, racist, huh? And, and I'm quoting her, insensitive to the nature of my interracial marriage. I was like, oh, word, bitch, I was. <laughs> and she, she would know that I myself am in an interracial marriage. That's right. In fact, my wife is Asian too. Surprise, bitch, I'll see you on Thanksgiving. <laughs> But my wife's not Chinese. She's Filipino. That's right, that's right. And our kids are Puerto Rican somehow, so there you go. <laughs> I don't give a fuck about interracial marriage. In fact, you know what? My mother is half white. A lot of people don't know that. Well, all right, you were a little too excited, but okay. 
A lot of people don't believe me when I say that, but it's true. You can't tell looking at me. But if I grew my hair out, <laughs> you would think you was at a fucking Cat Williams concert. My shit is... My shit is beautiful. The motherfuckers are just taking it too far. I don't know why or how everybody got this goddamn sensitive. You know who hates me the most? The transgender community. Yo, yeah, these motherfuckers. I mean, I didn't realize how bad it was. These motherfuckers, I was really mad about that last Netflix special. It's tough, man. I don't know what to do about it, because cause I like them. I always have. Never had a problem. You know, just fucking around. As a matter of fact, I think I make fun of everybody, and... I mean, as a group of people, they have to admit, it's kind of fucking hilarious, man. I'm sorry, bro. It's like, I've never seen somebody in such a hilarious predicament not have a sense of humor about it. They're born feeling like there's something other than they're born as, and that's, that's kind of funny, you know? I, I mean, it's funny if it's not happening to you. It's like that white black bitch that's in the news all the time. <laughs> Rachel Dozer. She's a white woman, but then she dressed up like a nigga and <laughs> shot her way up to the very top of blackness. <laughs> and I always wanted to meet her just so I could understand. I just wanted to like have dinner with her so I could just look in her eyes and call her a nigger to her face. <laughs> the fuck is that bitch talking about? I identify black. That is trans talk, lady. Stop biting. Stop biting. There's a big difference between her and a trans. The difference between her and a trans is I believe transgenders. I don't understand them either, but I know they mean what they say. Them niggas cut their dicks off. That's all the proof I need. I've never seen somebody just throw their dick away. Don't need it. I don't understand, but I believe you when I support your decision, motherfucker. But how far is Rachel willing to go? Hmm? What is Rachel willing to do so that we blacks can believe that she believes she's actually one of us? Bitch, are you willing to put a lien on your house? Invest in a mixtape that probably won't work out? She didn't even change her name. Didn't even change her name. Her name is Rachel. I can't believe in that name. If you want my support, you're gonna have to change your name to the blackest shit I've ever heard. Bitch, you're gonna have to change your name to Draymond Green. I don't know a blacker name than that. That shit is black on paper. If you type Draymond Green in the Airbnb, that shit will log off automatically. <laughs> People get mad, bro. People get mad about everything I say. I was doing a show. I was in Portland, Oregon. And I was checked in a, a hotel under the name Charles Edward Cheese. <laughs> I came back and there was a, a, a note, it was like a letter on my desk. It was addressed to Mr. Cheese. So obviously I'm gonna assume that whoever wrote this letter must be an intimate friend of mine. This is not some kind of name that a person would just guess. But then I opened the letter and it turns out I don't know this person at all. It's a fan letter. You know, I'm not even used to the idea that I have fans, but I'm grateful for it. And, uh, and it, even though I, I'm grateful for fans, I, I don't read those letters. <laughs> Be nice if I did, but realistically, it's like, what am I, Santa Claus, Nick? I don't have time for this. Like, got shit I want to do. I'm trying to chill. 
read all these dreams and wishes from strangers. But then, I, but I read it. I'd already opened it. So I just read the whole letter. And you know what, man? Whoever wrote this letter truly loves me. I mean, they were really fucking nice in the letter. And then they described to me what it was like to come to the show, how excited they were, how much fun they were having. And then they said that when I got to my jokes about transgenders, that they were, quote, devastated. Because <laughs> it turns out that whoever wrote the letter was transgender. Now, I'm going to be real for a second. You got to understand, I never feel bad about anything I say up here. And I, I would never admit this to you if I hadn't locked your phones up. <laughs> but it was the weirdest thing. Like, when I read this letter, I, this shit made me feel bad. I didn't feel bad about what I said, you understand? I felt bad that I made somebody else feel bad. To be honest, I don't even know what I said that upset that person. I have so many transgender jokes. <laughs> But I feel like, I feel like it was probably this joke I'm about to tell you right now. <laughs> and it's not even that bad of a joke. It's a true joke. I mean, it's not true, but I, I, I had read in the paper that Caitlyn Jenner was contemplating posing nude in an upcoming issue of Sports Illustrated. And I know it's not politically correct to say these things, so I just figured, fuck it, I'll say it for everybody else. Yuck. <laughs> oh, sometimes I just want to read some stats. I don't know why you're going to cram some man pussy in the middle of the sports page like this. I just didn't think that was the place for it. But I wasn't saying anything like Caitlyn Jenner's a bad person. I'm not mad at her for doing it. I'm not even mad at Sports Illustrated. If I'm mad at somebody, I'm probably just mad at myself. You understand? Stay down. I know that I am not strong enough to not look at those pictures. And I don't think I'm ready to see what she's trying to show me. So, Caitlin, God damn it, if you go through with this thing, bitch, you better go hard or go home. I want you to go all the way. Hustler style. Do you know what hustler style means, miss? That means spread the lips. <laughs> oh, she spreads the lips and there's an itty bitty dick inside. Ah! <laughs> the show is behind the curtains. said that upset that person. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you something. When I read that letter, and the moments after I read it, I did something that many black men in America do not have the time or the money to do. I thought about how I felt. Ask myself a very basic question that I don't think I ever directly contemplated. I said, man, Dave, if you're writing all these jokes, do you have a problem with transgender people? And the answer is absolutely not. The fuck do you guys think I am? I don't understand all the choices that people make. But I do understand that life is hard and that those types of choices do not disqualify you from a life with dignity and happiness and safety in it. But if I'm honest, <laughs> my problem has never been with transgender people. My problem is transgender people. I just feel like these things should not be discussed in front of the blacks. <laughs> it's fucking insulting all this talk about how these people feel inside. Since when is America given a fuck how any of us 
see you inside. And I cannot shake this awful suspicion that the only reason everybody is talking about transgenders is because white men want to do it. That's right. I just said that. If it was just women that felt that way, or black dudes and Mexican dudes being like, hey, y'all, we feel like girls inside, they'd be like, shut up, nigger. No one asked you how you felt. Come on, everybody, we have strawberries to pick. It reeks of white privilege. You never asked yourself why it was easier for Bruce Jenner to change his gender than it was for Cassius Clay to change his fucking name? And if I were to be brutally honest, the only reason I ever been mad at the transgender community is because I was at these niggas for six songs straight. I had no idea. And then the lights came up and I saw them knuckles. I said, oh no. And everybody was laughing at me. Hi, world stop. I said, why? Didn't you say anything? And then I heard that sultry voice. I didn't say anything, Dave Chappelle, because I was having a wonderful time. And I wasn't sure how you'd feel about it. I said, you knew how I'd feel. And she said, I'm going home. I don't want any trouble from you. I said, home? It's only two songs left. I mean, we might as well <laughs> finish tonight. And we ended up having breakfast together. <laughs> I'll grow up. That doesn't make me gay. I just titty fucked her. His <laughs> titties are as real as any titties in LA. It's two o'clock in the morning. I was just borrowing a little friction from a stranger. <laughs> Whoops. the madness of youth. It's the types of mistakes that a man makes when he's young. I wouldn't even know that it's necessarily a mistake. It was a wild night out. But I don't do it like that anymore. I'm old. I'm 44 now. Right. It's the first time in my life I've ever like started to physically feel my age. You can, it's tough, man. You know how I know I'm getting old? This is embarrassing, but I was in my hotel room. I was, I'm not gonna lie, I was jerking off, like. And I was like really sweating it out. <laughs> and this is when I knew I was old. I, I just gave up in the middle, like nothing even happened. I was just... like, I don't like looking at my dick anymore. My dick looks distinguished. It's old, an old looking dick. It's got salt and pepper hair all around it. My dick looks like Morgan Freeman in the 90s. <laughs> Without the dots. My dick narrates, Dave pulled me out and started jerking me around and jerking me around. But not with the same vigors when he was young. He and I both knew nothing was coming out. I see my age and my children. I came home from the road, this is not long ago. I, I've been gone for, if you can picture, I was gone for weeks and weeks. And when I came back, uh, nobody was home. Now one person in my family thought that uh, maybe I'd like to see them when I got back. Like, they knew when I was coming back, but they just weren't, they just weren't home. And that shit was a wake up call. You know, like when my kids were little, and the tour bus would pull up to the house, these motherfuckers would spill out. <laughs> Dad is home, hooray! And they'd hug me and kiss me, and then as the years went on, they'd get less interested. Hey everybody, look, it's Mr. Promises, back from the road. <laughs> but empty house, that's, that's some cold shit. <laughs> and I went into my oldest son's room, I was like, hello, hello, he was gone. And I'd never done this thing before, but for some reason I just did it. I just, I just looked through his shit. 
just to see who this motherfucker was becoming. And I found these notebooks and I started going through the notebooks and it was all this wonderful poetry in them. Written as his handwriting. I didn't even know this nigga wrote poems. And then I looked through his drawers and I opened up his middle drawer and I found his rolling paper. And I looked down at them papers like, oh, that's where that poetry's coming from. And that shit broke my heart. I mean, I smoke weed, but I mourned my son's innocence. And I cried a little bit. And I took his papers upstairs to my room. Rolled some weed that I'd hid from the family. And I got really high. And then I got paranoid. So I put his papers back how I found them. So he wouldn't know what I was up to. This nigga won't even know that that happened until he sees his special. Yeah, nigga, I found your papers. <laughs> He's a cold motherfucker. Let me tell you, this kid is only 16 years old. Listen to what he did to me. This motherfucker calls me up in the middle of the night. It was one o'clock in the morning. He goes, Dad, don't be mad. I knew something was terribly wrong. I said, what's going on? He said, listen, I'm fine. And don't forget, you told me to do this. I'm at a party and my designated driver had too much to drink. And me and my friends need you to come pick us up. I said, Jesus Christ, it's one o'clock in the morning, nigga. I am shit-faced. <laughs> but I figured, fuck, it's better me than some kid. I might as well roll the dice and go pick my nigga up. I said, all right, I'm coming to get you. Just give me the address and I'll be right there. And then he gave me the address and I was, I was shocked. I said, son, you are not going to believe this, but I'm at the same party, nigga. <laughs> they grow fast, don't they? Can I ask you a weird question? I don't want to make you feel uncomfortable. You don't have to answer it, and if it doesn't go well, we'll just edit it out anyway. <laughs> Is it weird to be the only white people in a row? <laughs> Is it weird? I mean, you can be honest. Does it feel strange? Are you worried at all? <laughs> Give me your money, motherfucker. I'm fucking around. This guy got ice in his veins. He didn't even buckle. You know, like many black men my age, the first time I voted was eight years ago. Yeah. I saw Obama on TV and said, oh, I'm voting for this nigga. I remember the day I voted for Obama. I voted in Ohio. And my vote matters in Ohio. Ohio is a battleground state, but when I pulled up to the polls, all the soldiers were in line. There were so many black people in that goddamn line, I didn't even know it was the polls. I thought it was a check cashing place. <laughs> we were hugging each other, and old people were singing hymns and spirituals. Day verdict times 10 or some shit. I've never seen black people that happen. Eight years later, I'm pulling up to the polls again. This time, I'm driving a brand new Porsche because the Obama years were very good to me. I was early voting, and when I parked my car, I figured out something that it would take the rest of the country another week to figure out. I understood that Donald Trump was going to be our next president because in Ohio, unlike D.C., you could see the results in the parking lot. It's all these goddamn pickup trucks and tractors and shit. <laughs> and then I walked up and I saw a long, long line of dusty white people. <laughs> yes, ladies and gentlemen, these were the poor whites. 
And I must tell you, I've never had a problem with white people ever in my life. But full disclosure, it's... <laughs> we've gotten a lot of trouble out of them. And I've never seen so many of them up close. I looked them right in their coal smeared faces. And to my surprise, you know what I didn't see? I didn't see one deplorable face in that group. I saw some angry faces and some determined faces, but they felt like decent folk. No, they did. In fact, I'm not even lying, and I didn't sound fucked up, but I felt sorry for them. I know the game now. I know that rich white people call poor white people trash. And the only reason I know that is because I made so much money last year, the rich whites told me they say it at a cocktail party. <laughs> and I'm not with that shit. And I stood with them in line, like all of us Americans are required to do in a democracy. Nobody skips the line to vote. And I listened to them. I listened to them say naive, poor white people things. Man, Donald Trump's gonna go to Washington, and he's gonna stand there thinking to my mind, you dumb motherfucker. <laughs> you are poor. He's fighting for me. And they all looked at me. They could tell who I was voting for just as easily as I could tell who they were voting for. But do you guys know what we all had in common? Not one of us, not a single one of us, looked like we felt good about what we had to do in that booth. <laughs> we were just doing our goddamn duty. Yes, I voted for Hillary Clinton. Of course I did. I voted for her because I liked what she said vastly better than I liked what he said. But to be honest with you, at that point, that shit was like watching Darth Vader do the I Have a Dream speech. <laughs> that bitch is mean as hell. She had already karate kid swept Bernie Sanders' legs from underneath him. Boy, it was hard voting for that shit. But that, it was the lesser of the evils. I know you were a Clinton supporter, Miss I. I'm sorry for her. But it didn't feel as good as it should have. She was going to be our first woman president. They were going to make coins out of this bitch. <laughs> and somehow she just missed the dunk. Of course she should have beat him. Of course she should have beat him. You know what voting for her felt like? It was bittersweet. It felt like I was lucky enough to eat Halle Berry's pussy. And whilst I was doing so, she fucking farted in my face, man. Now you understand, I'd still do it. But boy, I wish she didn't fart in this great nation's face. I voted that day, and then that same day I flew to New York City. I had work. That night I was in a comedy club in New York and I said to an audience almost exactly what I just said to you. And I didn't know that there was a journalist in the room. And this journalist wrote an article. The headline of the article said, Dave Chappelle is an avid. Yeah. I had no idea the paper said that. And you know how I found out? My wife called me from Ohio the next morning in a goddamn panic. David. David, what the fuck is going on in New York? I said, I'm being good, but what have you heard? And my wife said, the paper is saying that you're a Donald Trump supporter. I was like, whew. I said, don't worry about that shit, baby. Nobody in their right mind would believe that. And she said, no, David, people believe it. 
And then she started reading the comments to me. Oh, they were terrible. All these black people call me all kinds of Uncle Toms and shit. I should tell you, buddy, this is a very serious allegation from one black to another. I was incensed. Uncle Tom! How am I Uncle Tom, nigga? You the one that reads The Observer? Anyway, all this shit goes down around, and now Trump is the president, and I'm hosting Saturday Night Live. And I didn't really, like, prepare my monologue. I just kind of winged it. And at the end of the monologue, I don't even remember what I said. I said something like, you know, fuck it, like, we're uh, historically disenfranchised and we're going to give him, something about we're going to give him a chance if he gives us a chance. I don't know what I said, but whatever I said, I, I really wish I didn't say that shit. <laughs> it was not worth the trouble. And now I walk into the barber shop and all them black people just be looking at me like, yo, Dave, what's up with your boy? Yo, nigga, yo! Not my boy. Because I don't care if you're a Republican or Democrat, if you support him or not, any objective person is going to have to admit that uh, this motherfucker is having a terrible go of it. He really is. We've had presidents before that have done bad jobs, but this shit is worse than a bad job. It's scary to watch. Holy shit, it's like seeing a crack pipe in your Uber driver's passenger <laughs> The fuck is wrong with this guy? Yo, he is lunching, nigga. He, I watched, I watched Donald Trump in a press conference. And this motherfucker had all the media gathered, and this nigga literally, literally asked the media to their face to stop finding shit out. I was like, yo, <laughs> yo, this motherfucker is bugging. And then, I'm not even making this up, his, his lips started sweating. His lips. Have you ever seen a motherfucker's lip sweat? What the fuck is wrong with this nigga's lips? It's like if you're on a plane, right? You ever been on a plane? And like, I, I get scared to fly. I do it all the time. I be scared on there. And sometimes the plane will hit turbulence. And then I get nervous. But I always look at the flight attendant, and she looks calm, and it makes me feel calm. But if that bitch's lips were sweating... It's terrifying. Like, yo, nigga, why are your lips sweating? What do you know? And then, I'm not even making a shit up. This motherfucker grabbed the pot and he goes, you don't know how scary the things I read in my briefings are. What's that, bro? <laughs> That's bad leadership. <laughs> even as a parent, you think I'm gonna sit my kids down? Hey, no man, come here real quick. I was gonna holler at you for a second. Yo, uh, I'm three months behind on the rent, nigga, and I am worried. Very worried. Go on, go to school and have a productive day, nigga. I was just thinking out loud, getting some shit off my chest. I was like, what the fuck are you doing, bro? This is bad, man. Jesus Christ. All this motherfucker's ideas sound like high people ideas. Like, he doesn't think these things through before he tells us. He just tells us what he's thinking as soon as it occurs to him. This shit sounds nuts. Yeah. Uh, oh, I'm going to go to China, and I'm going to get those jobs from China and bring them back here to America. <laughs> For what, nigga? So iPhones can be $9,000? <laughs> Leave that job in China where it belongs. None of us want to work that hard. What the fuck is he thinking? Because I don't want to make them shits. What the fuck are you doing? Stop trying to give us Chinese jobs. I am going to bring back coal. Coal? I'm not 
not even exaggerating. I have never in my life even seen a fucking lump of coal. I honestly don't even know what coal is for. If you're gonna have motherfuckers digging around in the dirt looking for shit, find me some truffles, nigga. That's what I'm about. And these truffle prices are getting out of control. And if it gets any worse, I'm gonna be back down to regular butter like everybody else. <laughs> terrible, terrible job. This motherfucker hit North Korea with rap battle threats. Fire and fury, like, yo! Yo, what are you doing? It's fucking Korea, man. Kim Jong-un is a scary motherfucker. He's, he might be as crazy as Trump. Some scary shit. And if you're one of them naive motherfuckers that thinks that a war with Korea is going to be easy, then you don't play Call of Duty at 3 a.m. like I do. Because that's when the Koreans play. <laughs> Fucking eight-year-old Korean kid took out my whole goddamn platoon last night. I've never seen somebody in an office so high with the most just basic fucking solutions. Like, you know, we should not let any more Muslims in the country till we can figure out what's going on. Did he just say, figure out what's going on? <laughs> Who doesn't know how to do basic math? Let's count it out, okay? There's been 17 mass shootings in the United States. Four of them were done by Muslims. None of those four Muslims were from any of the seven countries in your stupid ass original band. <laughs> and since he brought it up, the other 13 shootings were done by the Tiki Torch Whites. <laughs> These are facts. You don't see me trying to ban white people from the show to keep it's a fucking terrible idea because it's mean and it's racist. And most importantly, it would be catastrophic to my bottom line. <laughs> if there were no white people here tonight, I might leave this bitch with $1,800. <laughs> this man needs to realize that we all need each other. And that's why we will never, ever be able to beat China. Because everybody in America is racist, and everybody in China is Chinese. <laughs> this motherfucker called it all wrong. And don't believe the media either, because as all this shit is happening, the media is trying to make us believe that the extremities amongst us are the norms. We can disagree. That's fine. And most of us are keeping a cool head about this shit. You know what I mean? Americans generally respect one another's beliefs, even if they don't share those beliefs. I know I do. I respect everybody's beliefs, except Amish people. Because <laughs> they are the only ones that I can say clearly their God is wrong. <laughs> the speed limit is 75 miles an hour in Ohio, and one lane of traffic is buggy. Nigga, your God is ridiculous. <laughs> All the Amish people around my way know me, too. Not from television, obviously. <laughs> they know me from the streets. Because when I see them horse and buggies, I, I'll pull the Porsche over and talk to them. <laughs> Ezekiel. <laughs> Ezekiel, are you sure that God doesn't want you to have any of this technology or this energy? Huh? Hmm? Huh? I can't hear you, nigga. Let me turn this air condition off. What did you say? And the niggas be like, get away from me, ye. Ye try to tempt me like the devil. Devil? Nah, bro. I'm trying to put you on to the game, Zeke. It's a big world out here, nigga. I just went 25 miles in 30 minutes. That's a day's journey for you. You don't even know what the weather's gonna be tomorrow, do you? 
I do. <laughs> you don't even know that there's a valuable Pokemon right on your I drive away. <laughs> huh? Oh, my vape pen? You want to hit my vape pen? Oh, sorry, nigga. I'm trying not to get herpes. My bad. <laughs> I've been playing cat and mouse with Herbie's for 30 years now, but every night I go to the club, I'll be like, not tonight, Herbie. <laughs> no disrespect, I'm not saying you have Herbie's, I'm just saying one out of five people do. So let's just, uh, let's just all be careful around this motherfucker and make sure that the, we leave with the lips we came with. Sometimes I think that the media is hard on Trump. Because I'll see shit that they get on him about that doesn't seem bad to me. I mean, a nigga got on Trump about not staying in the White House enough. Who gives a fuck? This motherfucker was rich. He used to shit in a gold toilet. <laughs> it's true. I don't know if you've ever been to the White House. It looks like a very nice place to work, but I wouldn't want to live in that Scooby Doo ass house either. That shit's <laughs> terrifying looking. Imagine you trying to jerk off. <laughs> Shit, Bush didn't stay there either. He was rich too. He was like, fuck that, I'm going to my ranch in Texas. Obama was the first motherfucker to move into the White House like, this is a nice place. <laughs> Look at this rug. The media got on him about putting Jared Kushner in his cabinet, and I didn't think that that was the worst thing he'd done. I mean, he was still early, and I mean, it's not unprecedented. Kennedy had his brother as the attorney general, right? And this motherfucker's a Washington outsider. To be honest with you, I'd probably do the same thing. As a matter of fact, I do. You think I go to a Hollywood meeting with all them white folks by myself? <laughs> I bring my nigga Mac Mittens from the streets. I don't even know his real name. Everybody just calls him Mac Mittens. <laughs> but I know he's not, he's not qualified to even listen to these meetings, but this motherfucker just makes me feel good. <laughs> and all the white people look at me like, Dave, do you mind asking your friend Mac Mittens to excuse us so that we can talk business? And I say, fuck that. Anything you say, and he listened to the whole meeting. And when they done talking, I just look over at Mac Mittens, and if he gives me the signal, meow, meow. I'll sign the papers. It's a gut check. Well, how about this one? Remember when the, it was the day after the election and the president of Taiwan called Donald Trump to congratulate him? And Donald Trump, you know, of course, took the call and talked to the president of Taiwan. Problem with that was uh, Taiwan doesn't have a president. <laughs> the United States functions on what they call a one China policy. And, Taiwan is a renegade province of said China. And Donald Trump didn't know that and picked up the phone and started yammering away and the media ate his ass up. And I'm not gonna lie, I was laughing like shit. I was like, oh shit, this dumb motherfucker is in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> and then that night I was in bed drifting off to sleep and then I had to admit it to myself, I was like, I didn't know that shit either. <laughs> and then I realized the media got the story wrong. The story wasn't that Donald Trump took the call. Nobody told Donald Trump not to take the call. That's terrifying. God damn, nigga, you don't have a Mac Mittens on your team? It wasn't like they were calling the White House. They were calling the switchboard at Trump Towers, and they were getting through. Anybody? Mr. President, there's a Ricky Ticky Tabby on the phone for you? Yes, put him through. Hello, hello, Ricky Ticky. Good to talk to you. Mr. President, there's a John Jacob Jingleheimer Smith on the phone. Oh, his name is my name, too. Put him through. Hello, hello, John Jacob. Let's talk business. How many people in this room are not originally from the United States. My round of applause. Where are you from, bro? You right there. Iraq. You're from Iraq? Ooh. 
I was fucking around. How long have you been here in the country? Uh, 23 years. 23 years? Are you a citizen yet? You are? Congratulations, nigga. Congratulations. <laughs> well, welcome to this great land. <laughs> you know, I'm going to give you a history lesson because I'm sure this wasn't on your entry exam. But every naturalized American has heard something about what I'm about to tell you. A picture is the early 50s in the United States. This 14 year old boy goes down from Chicago to Mississippi to meet his extended family for the first time. He'd never been to Mississippi. And before he went, his mother said to him, uh, very pointedly, she said, if a white man looks you in your eyes in Mississippi, look away. And I don't know what you know about black people from Chicago, but they're not a scared people. <laughs> Legend has it, he was in front of a convenience store hanging out with a white woman. Walked out of the store, and he thought she was pretty, and he said, <whistles> bye, baby. Not realizing that he had just made a fatal mistake. Four days later, Four days later, a group of adult white men burst into this family's home and snatched a 14-year-old boy out of bed in front of his family that was powerless to stop them, and he was never seen alive again. His name was Emmett Till. They found his body maybe a few days later. It was in a creek tied to a wheel so it would sink, horribly beaten and bloated. Hideous. And lucky for everybody in America, his mother was a fucking gangster. <laughs> she was. If you can imagine, in the very midst of a mother's worst nightmare, this woman had the foresight to think about everybody. She said, leave my son's casket open. She said, the world needs to see what they did to my baby. And every publication here in the United Times had this boy's horribly bloated body on its cover. And if our civil rights movement was a car, this boy's dead body was premium gas. This was a very definitive moment in American history where every thinking and feeling person was like, ugh, we got to do better than this. And they fought beautifully, and here we all are. And, and the reason that I bring that up tonight and why it's relevant now is because less than a year ago, the woman that he allegedly whistled at admitted on her deathbed that she lied in her court testimony. And you can imagine when we read that shit, we was like, ooh, you lying ass bitch. <laughs> it was furious. But that was my initial reaction. And initial reactions that we all learned as we get older are, are often wrong or more often incomplete. They call this phenomenon standing too close to an elephant. The analogy being that if you stand too close to an elephant, you can't see the elephant. All you see is its penis-like skin. <laughs> and give it a better look. And on stepping back, and thinking about it for a few moments, I realized that it must have been very difficult for this woman to tell the truth that heinous about herself at any point in her life, even the very end. And I was grateful that she had the courage to tell it before she left this world because it's an important truth and we needed to know. And I said to myself, well, thank you for telling the truth, you lying ass bitch. <laughs> And then time goes on, and then after time, you can kind of see the whole elephant. And it's humbling, because you realize that this woman lied, and that lie caused the murder. But that murder set in motion a sequence of events that made my wonderful life possible, that made this very night possible. How could this be that this lie could make the world a better place? It's maddening. And that's how I feel about this president. I feel like this motherfucker might be the lie that saves us all. 
because I have never felt more American than when Jesus Christ, it's good. And when it happens, I can see everybody that's struggling. So if I'm on stage and I tell a joke that makes you want to beat up a transgender, then you're probably a piece of shit and don't come see me anymore. <laughs> or if you don't understand that when a football player takes a knee during the national anthem, he's actually standing up for me, then you might not want to fuck with me anymore. But I swear, no matter how bad it gets, you're my countrymen. And I know for a fact that I'm determined to work shit out with y'all. And if that woman that said that heinous lie was alive today, I would thank her for lying. And then I would kick her in the pussy.